I'm Dave Casper. Welcome to another edition of Inclusive Magazine. Our guest today is Dr. Neil Park, the newest member of the Glidewell family, our new head of clinical affairs. Neil, welcome to the family. Thank you, Dave. Glad Appreciate that. I want to dive into your background, but I want to start first with what made you decide to go to dental school? How did you become a dentist? Well, Dave, I, I hope you're not expecting some kind of uh, enlightening inspiring or even interesting story because it, it, it doesn't go like that. Uh, the, the true story is that when I was a senior in high school in Miami, uh, we had a carpool. We had four guys that had a carpool together. And uh, three of us drove these uh, broken down, beat up old cars. And one of the guys pulled up in a really nice Pontiac Bonneville convertible with leather upholstery. And that guy's father was a dentist. And that got the rest of us to be very interested in the field of dentistry. And, and in fact, three of those four guys are, are now dentists. But on a more serious note, I didn't have anybody in my family that had previously been involved in dentistry. So all I knew about dentistry was what you know as a patient, which isn't very much. And when I was an undergrad at Bucknell University and I came home to Florida for my, you know, for my uh, vacation and to get my recall visit, I had a nice heart to heart with my dentist who was very supportive of, of uh, me getting involved in dentistry and gave me a lot of advice about the educational requirements and, and the, uh, the great uh, lifestyle that you can have potentially as a dentist and, and the other things that, that go with it, bringing uh, smiles to people and really uh, improving their quality of life. And driving a Pontiac. And driving a Pontiac Bonneville, right. <laughs> Fantastic. So you went to a Temple for dental school, right? That's right. That's right. How did you choose that school? Uh, well, you know, it was, it was kind of a, a cost-based decision. I, I had just finished college in Pennsylvania, and I was accepted to Temple and to Penn. Penn is an incredibly wonderful uh, dental school, but it was private private school and very high tuition. Temple is a state school, and so the, the tuition was much lower and uh, uh, got a good education and came out a, a little bit less encumbered than I might otherwise have done. That's fantastic. Since this is a, a dental implant and technology-based magazine, uh, I'd be remiss in not asking you, was there any dental implant uh, curriculum or courses in dental school for you? You know, we have. I'm not calling you old, but I'm just right, curious. Exactly. Related to the time. Yeah, the, uh, uh, I do remember in one lecture, uh, the basic information that I received was uh, dental implants are really bad, and if you're an ethical practitioner, you'll you'll stay far away from them. Great, great. Hi higher education. Exactly, exactly. So, did you go into private practice then? I, I entered uh, the public health service. Indian Health uh, in, on the Hopi Reservation in northeastern Arizona. Did that for a couple of years, and then I went back to Florida to private practice. Oh, fantastic. And how long, uh, how long were you in private practice? I was in private practice for, for 12 years. Oh, great. Now, you've had a great career working for some of the uh, largest market-leading companies in the dental uh, implant and dental technology space. But uh, what, what made you decide to get out of private practice and, and, and come to this side of things? You know, when you, when you first go into practice, you have all of this debt from your education, and then you layer on top of that the debt to start a new practice. So for those first 12 years of private practice, I, I really didn't have a lot of options. You know, you go to work and you make your practice successful, and uh, there really wasn't a lot of taking stock in, of, of what you like to do. And, and after the 12 years when the financial burdens were lifted and the practice was successful, I, I took a hard look and said, what kinds of things do I really enjoy doing, and how do I want to map out the rest of my life? And I, I really felt like uh, I enjoyed getting out with people. I enjoyed speaking in public. I enjoyed negotiating with people about different things. So I made the somewhat questionable decision that I was going to go to law school. Huh. So I, I uh, sold my practice. And normally when a practice is for sale, it's sort of on the, on the downswing, right? It's, a, it's, it's an older doctor mm, whose right, right. practice hasn't been growing. But since my practice was still on the, on the upswing, it, it sold very, very quickly. And then well, I had a charge enough for it then. Yes, <laughs> possibly, yeah, possibly. But I, I had a few months before law school started. And at that point, I was recruited by, by the leading uh, company in this very brand new field of dental implantology. So I thought, okay, I'll go to work for them for a few months till, till uh, law school starts. But from the minute I, I got involved in, in the industry, I just, I just loved every minute of it. You know, it was, it was exactly what I was looking for. You know, it was the opportunity to work with people who had talents very different from mine, people that I could learn from. And, you know, to me, the biggest thing was, was this new technology, this osseointegrated dental implants. This had the capacity to change the practice of dentistry 
but more importantly, to change people's lives uh, more than anything else that I've seen come along in dentistry. Yeah, for sure. And I, I want to dive into uh, to dental implants, but I want to go back to something you just said related to dental students graduating with a lot of debt and a, a big financial burden. We hear that a lot today, and do you think that that in any way contributes to the rise uh, in the DSO space, these group practices, corporate dentistry? There seems to be so many graduates that start there. That's right. That's right. It's, it's a, uh, I mean, thank goodness that there is a place for the young graduate who needs to start earning money right away. There's a place for him to go. You know, typically if you open a private practice or you associate in a, in a small private practice, it takes a while to, to get your income to a, to a reasonable level. DSOs offer a great opportunity for people to get out there and start seeing patients right away. Um, they often have a salary uh, so that they can can uh, sort of get their act together and and decide how their career wants to wants to look for the rest of their lives. Right, uh, it, it's almost like a modern day GPR. In the, in the old days, that seemed to be the the, the destination for a recent graduate who wanted to expand their education, That's not right. continue to go into uh, debt. Let's say. Right. And now it's the. Uh, it's the large chains. And, and in, in many respects, it, it does function that way because some of the large DSOs have training programs. They, they have a, a career path for these young doctors to gain more clinical skills as, as well as to, uh, to better their financial situation as well. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's tie that into uh, your comment about uh, dental implants and dental implant technology. Uh, what's your take on the general dentist's access to implant training today? Uh, has it improved since your days at Temple? Uh, are there are, are there formalized curriculum, or is it still is it still based on a, a champion or somebody driving it individual to a dental school? So um, I, I was very fortunate to be involved in the way that industry supported the changing of the core curriculum in dental schools, so that now uh, pre-doctoral students in most cases have a really nice introduction to dental implants. If if uh, it really started about 2005. The U.S. deans or the deans of the U.S. dental schools got together and had a meeting and they decided that they, they would make this commitment to make dental implant treatment part of the core curriculum for pre-doctoral students. So I was part of uh, a group of companies that assisted with this. They assisted in curriculum development, assisted in parts and pieces and the things that you need to do to get the, the program up and running. So. As, as opposed to when I came out of school where there was either no information at all or very poor information, a at this point it's very different. So the, the young dentist coming out of school today uh, will have had a, a lot of lectures and will have had the opportunity to do some simulation exercises in the laboratory. They've also most likely treatment planned some cases and restored some cases. Uh, it's most likely that they have not had the opportunity to place implants. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think is needed for this group of dentists that are graduating today? They've at least had some exposure at the undergraduate level, but if they go into private practice, I think a recent statistic said that maybe up to 40% of these dentists end up in a DSO for at least 24 months, uh, which is great from a patient care perspective, and I want to explore that. But how do they then make the transition into learning more about implants to, to truly incorporate that that indication or that method into a, into a private general dental practice? One of the big differences with today's graduate is that in most cases they have the expectation that they will be involved at some point in their career in the surgical placement of dental implants. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. That's where they're going to go. So what they need to do, and, and as we said, in the pre-doctoral curriculum, there just really isn't time to go into the surgical aspects of it, but they've had some good grounding in treatment planning and, and restoration. So then it's really left up to that graduate to find a pathway to learn the, the skills, to right. learn the information, and to, and to get the practical experience to, to provide this treatment. Yeah. Is there typically something in your experience that is uh, um, a, a point at which it makes the dentist decide, hey, I, now I'm ready for this? Is it experience-based? Is, is there an a educational component to that? What, what makes one decide now's the time to, to dive in? You know, a, a lot of times it's just simply a, a good educational opportunity presents itself in, in a lot of cases. Um, there's also situations where people have had 
practice analyses done, looking at the procedures that they do, and say, gee, you know, you're extracting a lot of teeth, you're doing a lot of partial dentures, you're doing a lot of removable dentures, and there's some additional care that your patients would benefit from that you're really not recommending. Yeah, yeah. We've had a, a number of uh, clinicians sit in that very chair, and I always ask the same question. What made you decide to place that first implant? And more often than not, it's a given patient came in and exactly. said, I want you to do it. Exactly. And that's when you, they made the decision know, to so, learn. So many dentists have been dragged kicking and screaming into dental implantology, <laughs> and, and that's a good thing, you know, as long as they, they can get the, the right training. And right now, there's a lot of choices in getting this kind of training. So there's in industry-sponsored programs. There's several very strong uh, freestanding educational institutes that provide this training. They also have choices on, on the format. You know, there's the, the shorter, like, uh, two-day type format, and then there's the longer type format that goes, that goes a full year. A much so, deeper dive. Yeah, and there, there's, a, there's a lot of good opportunities for the doctor that's willing to invest the, the time and the money to, yeah. to get this training. Yeah, which is a good thing, right? It is. More access. Uh, let's switch back to uh, the dental implant companies, the dental implant industry you mentioned earlier. Uh, instead of law school, you decided to go work <laughs> for uh, one of the leading dental implant companies. I think that the world probably doesn't need another lawyer, so uh, we're glad that you I made I think it all it. worked out, right? Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're glad that you made the decision that you did. Uh, back then, there were something like five dental implant companies selling implants in the U.S., uh, if I'm guessing the year right, M maybe six. Uh, and now there's a hundred, whatever the, the number is. It, why is that? What Does the world need that many dental implant systems? Are, are these companies so significantly different from each other? What, what's driving this expansion at the product level? So I think part of it is um, a price umbrella that's been created by the premium companies. So, so they've set a retail price that's pretty significantly high. And other companies find that, gee, we think we can make a product that, that is similar. And, and in, in many cases, you see sort of knockoff products mm -hmm. that, are, that are priced less. They don't have the R&D involved. And they don't provide some of the other services that are of value to some doctors but may not be of value to other doctors. So, so there's, there's sort of a fragmentation in the industry. There's, there maybe you could even call it tiers. You know, there's the, the premium tier, there's the, the mid-level tier, and then the, the value tier. And most of it's based on what kinds of ancillary services the doctor would like to have or requires in order to make his practice grow in the direction that he wants it to grow. Right, right. You mentioned R&D earlier. It's interesting. I think back when uh, when you and I were selling implants. Wow, that is a long time ago. <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> when there were really only a half a dozen companies or so, uh, it, was all, uh, it was all surface wars and documentation and research and development to really justify my product works better than the next guy's product. Uh, and today, and I, tell me your thoughts if you think this is good, uh, bad, or indifferent. Today there's just an assumed position that, meh, they all work. That's right. Th there's, there's an assumption that the product is safe and effective. And then it's a question of, of which particular features the, the doctor prefers. I, you know, and, and of course, there's, there's uh, very strong opinions based on, on uh, you know, the preservation of crustal, crustal bone, the preservation of hard and soft tissue. That's what it's all about. And some of that relies on technique, and some of it relies on, on implant design. And doctors have a, a wide choice of getting what they think will, will work best. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that uh, very much. The, you mentioned tier one and tier two companies. If you look at the market leaders, uh, the, the companies that historically hold the bulk of the market share in the space, it seems to me there's an increasing trend that I would call different sameness related to these companies. You have traditional uh, market-leading companies that were big in, let's say, uh, tissue-level implants introducing a bone level or a two-stage okay. implant, and, and, and vice versa. The, the number one or the number two, conversely, is now, well, I didn't have that, I'm going to add this. At some point, is that just noise, or is it expanding the existing customer base? What, what impact is that having? You know, I, I think uh, at this stage of the market, at this level of development, it's rarely about the product. And what defines market leadership is, you know, uh, defining a specific technological advancement and then bringing that forward. I, I think an example would be um, All on Four. Okay, so when All on Four was promoted, it was put together as a really good, effective way to, for a dentist to provide immediate load, full arch 
cases for pe people that badly needed it. And the, the company that, that promoted All on Four and brought it out in an educational method um, did a lot of good for the market. And I think, you know, that's where we are right now in the market. It, it's about finding a solution and the solution certainly uses certain products, but it's not 100% product dependent. I think the company you're mentioning, uh, you're referring to, is Clear Choice. We had Dr. Mark Adams here as a guest not so long ago, and it was an interesting conversation because he talked about in the beginning or early on in implantology, everyone was doing full arch cases. Uh, and then there seemed to be this lull where you would talk to dentists and specialists even that said, well, I don't see many of those, those patients anymore. And since Clear Choice made their uh, entrance into the marketplace, the direct-to-consumer advertising, now everybody's doing full arch cases. W were those patients just missing for a while or w what happened that, that they disappeared and that they came back? Is it really the outreach to the patient directly or? Well, so, so Dave, as you know, I, I had a, the good fortune to spend a couple of years w with the, the Clear Choice team. And, and what's really interesting is that the patients that are having this full arch edentulous treatment don't come in as edentulous. So those patients come in with terminal dentitions. So this is the guy that's been walking around suffering, you know, the illness of advanced periodontal disease, advanced dental decay, lots of missing teeth, unattractive smile, um, lack of confidence, all those, all those lifestyle issues, and didn't know what to do. And what Clear Choice did was this direct-to-consumer advertising that showed them that there is a solution to this problem and showed them where to get it, and also gave a, a very convenient treatment and buying experience to the patient. Right, right. So that patient that you mentioned, though, that patient example, is he not going to a, a regular general dentist uh, regularly? Is that why he hadn't been exposed to this information? That's right. That's right. Um, I think you said that the, the doctors weren't seeing those patients. Well, you could also say those patients weren't seeing the doctor. <laughs> I think that's probably <laughs> right. That's probably and, and, more and in accurate. many cases, these are people that haven't been to a dentist for 10 years or more, or maybe they've just had some extractions on occasion as needed. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, back to the market leaders for a second. Uh, we've talked about the all on four being a, a solution that's presented and ultimately resulted in a clear choice business model, if you will. What's next in that space? I mean, we, I, I think collectively as an industry, we need the market leaders to, in fact, drive the market to expand options and to get more dentists in the pool. It's such a deep pool, even today, there's so much opportunity in front Absolutely. of us. What, in your view, what's next on the horizon? It's, it's the improvement of the workflow. And, and, and right now, there are so many different entry points for a doctor wishing to do cases like this. There's, there's different entry points for the patient and there's different entry points for the doctor. And I, th I think what's coming now is all the pieces are there. You know, if, if you look at um, the great, you know, now we have the availability of 3D imaging that gives the doctor such, such a, a, a rich uh, visual of what's going on in his patient and allows him to go into the operating room with so much more knowledge about what he's going to face to deliver better care to the patient. So the, the parts and the pieces are there, intraoral scanning, uh, CAD CAM, all the, the great things we can do with, with design. Um, all those parts are there, but the workflow isn't there yet. And I think that's the big advance that's coming. Right, right. I agree. And so many people we talk to uh, talk about guided surgery, for example, as a as a tool and maybe the most significant tool to get a general dentist comfortable with the surgical placement of a dental implant. Uh, why, why isn't everybody doing that? Is it the cost associated with guided surgery? Is it the workflow that you mentioned? What, what's preventing this from just becoming the standard if, it, if in fact it would have that much of an impact right. on the business? Guided surgery is a tremendous technical advancement and, and it has a, 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 certainly has a place. But what I found is that when doctors and of course, guided surgery depends 100% on the availability of, of 3D imaging. Right, cone right? beam. Cone beam, you know. Yeah. And, and of course, um, what I found is that when doctors have those 3D images available to them, then they say, okay, well, I've got this rich data set now. I, I know what's coming, and I don't need to have guided surgery quite as often as I thought I was going to need it. So it, it still has its place. But remember, it's not a substitute for training and experience and planning. Sure but it certainly will have its place going forward. So you're saying uh, guided surgery trains the operator, trains the dentist to not need guided surgery? 
let, let's say if, if a doctor purchased a CBCT so that he could do guided surgery, he may now find that he doesn't need to do guided surgery now that he has the CBCT. Ah, interesting, interesting. So it's an expensive investment for something that uh, will at least get the dentist involved maybe sooner in their yeah. career, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a great way to practice. It does give tremendous information, but it's not a required prerequisite for delivering good care. Yeah, true, true. Uh, let's go back to education for a second. Uh, as we recently announced a strategic partnership with Dr. Carl Misch and the Misch Institute, have you had any exposure with uh, Dr. Misch? What, what's your uh, what's your opinion there? So everyone in our industry knows Dr. Carl Misch. Uh, he, he's truly one of the giants, and he has contributed a, as much as anybody to the advancement of, of dental implantology. I mean, my goodness, he, he's written the two most popular textbooks, the, the two standard textbooks in dental implantology. But I think he might agree that his greatest legacy is probably the Mish Institute. And in the years that, that you and I have, have been in this field, I, I have to say that whenever I meet a general dentist that has a really successful private practice in, 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 and does a lot of implants and his implant practice is growing, that doctor was invariably trained at the Mish Institute. You know, they've put together a program that, that does everything from the biology you know, and Carl always talks about how this is not carpentry. This is, this is a, a, you have to have a, an understanding of the biomechanics, and they have an understanding of the treatment planning that's based on their understanding of the biology and the biomechanics. And then, of course, then all the skills that are required to place implants and restore them successfully. So it, it's a year-long continuum. It's a tremendous program. It's absolutely the, the top in the industry. Yeah, we're, we're really proud to be part of it, so we're looking forward to it as well. Uh, let's talk about your new job, Director of Clinical Affairs here at Glidewell. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, had the chance to visit us, we have a number of clinicians, a number of operatories, all working in a research and development capacity here at the company, and we've charged Dr. Park with leading that group and coordinating our efforts. What's, uh, what's on your agenda here early on? So the secret to success in putting together any program in our industry is to focus on the needs of the doctor. And, and what the doctor needs. And, you know, I've had this, I would say, maybe unique background of, of some years of private practice and then some years in, uh, in the industry. So, so my goal is to take that experience and bring it to our dental customers, our dentist customers in particular, so that they can incorporate new technologies into their practice, be more successful, offer more services, more successful treatment to their patient. That's really what I want to do here. You know, we have such a unique situation here at Glidewell, as you mentioned. I think we have you know, 77 scientists in our in our R&D department. We have a team of, of four dentists. So we can, we have sort of a, a, a closed feedback loop, right? We can, True. We can, yeah, come up with, with a product idea. We can test it. We can do a clinical study. And only then, when we know that it works, then we can launch it to, to the, our, our dentist customers. And I think that's a, it, it's, a, it's a rare opportunity, and it's very exciting to see what we can do to, to advance dentistry. Yeah, we agree. Glad you're here, sir. Welcome Enjoy to the team. It. Thanks, Dave.